Yes, definitely. Smidar, did you have something that you wanted to say about Claudia? Uh, um, well, it's uh, so recent, her, uh, her love of drugs and uh, um, well, I think, I think maybe, I, I don't have much that at this point, but, but I know that I already told her husband that, that we won't mention his name and this, uh, Okay, so very happy to hear that. Okay, great, great. And um, Avram Rosenkir, who many of you know, in fact, I think everybody knows him, uh, was very uh, supportive and instrumental in helping us begin this uh, process with, with uh, Moshe. And uh, a very dedicated man to children and to the community, and particularly to multicultural understanding. And that was evident in literally every interaction that we ever had, uh, professionally or privately, wherever he went with Avram and whenever he met someone, whether it was when we were with him in Israel or when he came here to the United States. He always conveyed that sense of warmth and kindness, just gentle gentleness that was uh, a wonderful attribute. So they are both truly people that we will remember and hope and keep inside ourselves as, as models for what we aspire to accomplish. And um, hopefully we'll make them proud. And I think we have. Okay, I think each one of you so um, if we can, then we will go right to Raquel's presentation. Um, one of the things, I'm going to stand a little while I'm talking sometimes because I want to see this group as well as this group <laughs> and, um, and Smidar. But uh, one of the things that we're going to be presenting today is um, last May of uh, 2012. Walsh, Ohio State University, Walsh University and Oregon College conducted an online face-to-face -face course that focused on inclusion of young children with disabilities. Now, we changed the word of disabilities to children with special rights, taking uh, from the Salamanca um, statement in terms of, of how we look at um, children with disabilities. But we were looking at inclusion of young children with a focus on preschool through third grade into general education settings. Um, so, and we were doing it through American and Israeli uh, cultures and perspectives. Um, what we did is took a very, what we call a historical cultural framework. So it's the idea that one country is not better than another, but that how one does inclusion is located within the context of that country. So in a sense, what we were trying to do, one of the things we were trying to do in our inclusion classes that um, and actually, we had four classes that were going on in this course in May. One was Smidar's class, one was Rahel's section that was happening both in Israel, and then there was Jeannie's class through Walsh University and myself at Ohio State. Um, so we, we um, so our, one of our thoughts here is that from the cultural historical framework is that we borrow from each other in terms of what ha what's good for us. So again, it's not that one country is doing quote inclusion better than another, but that we all have um, different ways of doing inclusion thinking about inclusion and that by the students starting to learn about inclusion that they're learning from each other 
of, of how to do that. So, um, so we taught it in May, and what Raquel has done so nicely uh, with Smidar's uh, support is put a slideshow presentation together that is telling us the story of what has happened in this course. Um, part of that story involves um, a pilot research project that we did from this uh, course. And we're now at the point of we've done it, we need to do it again, we, we're learning from it. So we're really hoping that this is also going to be a dialogue, a sharing, and I quite honestly, I've been dialoguing with other people already in terms of thinking about, okay, what are our next steps? So um, the thinking is after we can talk today, after we present the project, share what went well, what we need to work on more for the next time, is that Smidar, Rahel, Jeannie, Rita, myself, and others who want to be involved will get together to kind of talk about next steps in terms of the next course and how we want to think about it. Okay? So when can it be the next time? We are hoping uh, that it will be in the spring. Yes. But again, it's all, you know, we're, we need to formalize it and figure that out. Yeah. Can we tell an idea? Hmm? Okay. okay, so um, this is this presentation, as Lori said, it, it's actually a story of the project and the study we did on. Okay, I should speak. Moshe knows. I speak very, very low tones. So. <laughs> Madam, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. The, uh, the presentation is actually going to be, we'll start with the course and the components of the course and then we'll move on to the study itself. But the study will be told, the story of the study will be told, will be told from the perspective of the Israeli students. Okay? And you'll see why uh, in a bit. So this is how the presentation is going to develop. I'm going to give a very short uh, definition of inclusion, be very, very specific about the Israeli special education law, course rationale, then move on to the process of designing and implementing the course, course methods, and then the second part is the study, and then final notes, and I'm, I'm going to leave uh, to end the presentation with my final notes. I'm not going to speak about the recommendation because I think Smodau can expand on that through dialogue with Lori and Jimmy. So, um, hopefully, so just to craft a, a definition of inclusion, it's, it's a dynamic process. It's not one rigid concept. It, it changes across time, it changes across culture, and we really want the end product to be a non-segregated set. And we speak about the quality of educating children with or without special needs, special rights. And we regard inclusion as a social movement and social reform, which leads to educational um, reform. And on the whole, education of all children within, we, we seek education of all children within their communities. And inclusion implies the need for these settings to consider the structures, teaching <coughs> philosophies and approaches. And we aim um, to expand student knowledge of the use of support and guidance to better respond to the needs of all children attending the setting. So, in fact, inclusion is not just about children with special needs, it's about children with special rights. That means each child has special rights. Special rights. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think the other thing is, um, as Raquel is saying, um, and we try to impress on our students, it's not just 
one way to do inclusion. Physically placing a child with special rights into a general ed classroom is not inclusion. We expect that children should be learning as well as they're learning academically as well as socially in um, general ed settings. And if I can talk from the American um, perspective, is we still have a long way to go before we do that. We really are not implementing inclusion to the, the point of, work, of how we're looking at it in terms of definitions. We still are doing a lot of uh, inclusion in, quote, segregated settings. And students might be, who have special rights, may be in general ed settings, but only for a short period of time. We're still um, including a lot of students still in the segregated settings. Exactly. Yeah, and if I can add, too, that this is a continuing issue that I know Lori and I talked early, you know, in the 80s, I was involved in working with teachers to do the same thing. And here we are in 2013, and it's some of the same issues, because there have been improvements, but in terms of quality and in terms of, I think, of the respect that we're able to present for every child to make sure we're meeting every child's needs, um, and that it's actually something that's, again, socially, culturally, developmentally, so it's very complex. Okay, just to, um, uh, uh, to make it clear, we are actually very, the, the old issue of special uh, needs children's rights is quite new to Israel because only in 1988 the special education law that, that um, states that a, a child with certain, certain needs has to get certain uh, services was uh, accepted in the Knesset, and only in 2002 we have uh, we had a specific article was changed to support inclusion of children with special needs. Okay, so that we are still on the level of special needs children. So that's quite new, and I remember the day uh, Lori just. Uh, realized that we were quite new in this business. It's not something that, um, it's not from the 70s, okay? Yes, and that's I, I do want to add that the law was, was uh, only in, implemented in 1988, but special education was, in, yes. uh, was present in Israel much before that. Yes, yes. yes. The world was flat. But there wasn't a law that that specified exactly what education is. Yes. Right. And I think um, what I hadn't realized at first is when I, Smidar, when we talked in November of 2010 in Boston, one of the mm -hmm. things, kind of where the story starts, um, well where it started with us with the Global Learning Project was that um, that Orning College in early childhood was thinking about implementing or starting an inclusion um, class. So the thought was, well, we would come together to talk about how that was, how we would develop that. Okay, this is just the one we use now uh, when we Try to explain to students the difference between the, the sub concepts that stand under the shiluv. Okay, shiluv is uh, is uh, not shiluv achala. Okay, is inclusion. Okay, but what um, do we make of the achala? Okay, so we have inclusion, which is achala, in which students with various Various needs are within one class, okay? And we have the shiluv, which is actually the mainstream, or in the extremist, in the extreme definition that would be times also integration, in which we say that within the regular class there is a group of children with with special needs, 
and they are they get a very specified uh, support and in times different curriculum. And you need you have the hafrada, um, which is separation in which two groups of students learn by next to each other, but they hardly ever uh, interact with each other. And then you have exclusion, okay, where all children, where all special needs children are outside of the normal okay, uh, environment, and these children hardly receive any you know, support. Okay? So that's um, to clarify concepts. So why do we need a course about inclusion? Mainly because we, we do encourage value-focused education system because inclusion is a social uh, is a social value and we want to focus on quality and equality within our educational setting. And why cross-cultural? I just asked my wife wanted to add. Okay. okay. And why cross-cultural is just uh, have two quotes um, this is from, our, students. from our students. The first one on the left, I've been exposed to various ways and principles regarding early childhood inclusion. I came to an understanding that the process of inclusion is common amongst different countries, although education setting and approaches vary from one country to another. And the second quotation, I think that learning from the other is meaningful and important, especially when we speak about students from the USA who they are, that's, uh, is that, who daily experience inclusion. With, uh, with, uh, these are, uh, these are Smodar students. Ah, students. Students, 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 yes, okay. quotes, yes, taken from Smodar's class, okay? Okay, when we first, and Lori will uh, expand on us, when we uh, constructed this course, we began with designing the framework, then we moved on to implementing an in-action reflection. That means that through all of the course implementation, talks and... Um, so anyway, talks were held between the staff members, and at the end, at the end we, we had an on, a reflection on action, and then we're on the stage of on the stage of redesigning uh, the course again. Okay. She'll come back. Okay. The main uh, emphasis is according to the definition of inclusion. Okay. The main emphasis is to make a change in structures. Slow down. Okay. The main emphasis is to make changes in the stru in structure, in educational structures, in teaching philosophies and educational approaches, and to promote the use of support environments to better respond to the needs of all children attending the setting. So we are not speaking about children with special needs, we're speaking about children with special needs. Okay? So what um when I went over in June and July um, in 2011, uh, I, um, I, there I met Rahel and Smidar again, and I also met and stayed at Arvid Dorr's um, house in, um, while I was um, with my stay with Orlean College, and the three of them spent a lot of time showing me about what's going on in inclusion within the area. And that was very helpful. We interviewed um, uh, teachers, administrators who have been involved in inclusion. And that um, gave me an idea of how maybe um, we could be working together in projects that we could do and as we're doing that obviously the dialogue was going on of what I was doing 
also in um, the United States in terms of in, uh, inclusion and in teacher preparation. So I think one of the main things that we did when uh, Lori was in Israel was to create a common language. She gave us a description of early childhood education in the USA, in the States, and we gave and showed her how, how, how our system works. So we've kind of created a common and shared language, which was helpful. So one of the things, I can jump in, that um, we really wanted this course to be put together by both the Israelis and the Americans. And we had to think about, okay, how is that going to be done? We didn't want to just share syllabi and that they would pick and choose, you know, you know, with syllabi. So one of the, we came up with two ways to do that, two projects to do that. One was videos that we would actually make videos um, of families in Israel who, were in, who, who had ch um, children with special rights and how they were, their perceptions of inclusion and issues that they were going, um, they were facing in their country and as well as teachers in Israel and what they were doing. And then, um, and then I developed the same thing, but within the states. Um, so that was one project that we had um, started to design, and then, and then we talked about the book sharing. Yes. And so three uh, methods. Laura spoke about the videos, okay, um, across cultures. We had the book sharing project, which are. Um, um, expand in a moment, and we had the, um, board, the discussion board in which students shared their um, lesson plans and reflection on what uh, they had done. So these were the project, okay? So what I'm going to do now is use quotations, use student quotations taken out of the site of the, the discussion board and show you how the method developed all through the course. So this is the, the, um, the first sharing okay, of information <coughs> between uh, students from each culture. And this was getting to know each other. Right, this was a big thing. We really, think, we really um, thought it was really critical that our students introduce themselves to each other because they needed to, we knew that relationships had to be established before they could actually do anything else. So that's where we were going um, with this. So we gave everybody an assignment um, and we had, um, we gave everybody assignment to basically write a paragraph of themselves, who they were, and then they would put an artifact up or picture that would represent, you know, their identity in some way. So you can see already in this, uh, these plots the differences between the students in the States and in Israel. Um, the first one is an Ethiopian-oriented student, descended student, and the second one is it's a um, student from Walsh who has already a degree, <laughs> okay? Our student is a pre-service student doing her first degree. And the Walsh University student has, is, is in a higher stage, in a higher stage of learning. Well, so, also this was a second language. Yes, so yes, yes. Or a third language. Yes. yes. But she speaks the Hebrew fluent. Yes, she's very strong. Okay, this is another quotation, Nadal just, uh, her picture is on, yeah, uh, which following the, read, following the sharing of knowledge, of the personal information, they started to ask, the Israeli students began asking the American students whether they could meet face to face, mm -hmm. okay? And you can see there is a lot of excitement in the beginning. The second one, hi Anna, we were very we were excited to read the letter, and now we will be happy to talk with you face to face. Can you write us when it's convenient for you to talk? Please pay attention to the difference of seven hours between Israel and Chicago. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. And these are, this is their writing. I wasn't, no, I think Smadal wasn't involved in how they wrote. 
this is the way they roll. Manco is very, is, is very strong, very high self-esteem. And she also has the ability to know the other. She said from the beginning, I don't mind the language because I know, they know I don't speak in English fluently. So it doesn't matter as long as I, I can express clear, clearly what my thoughts are. And if I can just jump in too, yeah. you know, I joined this group, collaborative group, later um, because Lori, Smadar, and Rachel already had really developed this course from their work together. Then I went to Israel um, with Rita and Gary and John last March and um, was able to visit Smadar's class that had already started. So I just wanted to mention that, that Rita and I actually went to her class and they spent we spent a long time in there. And, and you were fantastic. Well, it was just yeah, a wonderful yeah. exchange. And I know, you know, immediately some of the students, even when we talked, because we just talked, and they said, you know, please excuse my English. That, that probably happened 10 times during that time. And I said, no, just, just you know, just talk. And, and, and that, a couple of them commented, I'm a little worried about when we start doing this with the English. And so that I just wanted to mention that was something that, that helped me understand, being able to meet them and know where they were in terms of, of their language. But they really wanted to meet each other. So this is, uh, these are several quotes uh, taken out of the, the first conversation. And what the American students were interested in is the service in the army, which all of us in Israel have to do. So, um, this is came up as the main thing, mm -hmm. okay? And this is part of Smadar's uh, introduction. We all introduced ourselves okay. to, it wasn't just the students. Right? And you can see, you can read it for yourself, and then you can see this is a student from... Oh, somewhere, John? Pretty. Oh, pretty. Okay. 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 There. Yeah. This is sure. uh, a student from Walsh University responding to Smadar. <laughs> okay. You can see the similar um, uh, interests.
uh, wasn't familiar with all those tools. Well, anyway, this is her response, Marcus' response. Hi, guys. How about M Sam? In the Ethiopian language, the Amharic, the meaning of the word M Sam is a kiss. <laughs> the inner meaning is connection, and I haven't changed anything. This is how she wrote that. And it's a verb between people. That way, I think the name M. Sam could be perfect for us. And what happened is that they didn't respond to her. And once they didn't respond, her motivation fell down. She, she wasn't. Um, very keen to go on with them. Um, Whose group was it? Is your group going? It must have, well, that was, the whole thing was we put them in discussion groups. So there were about five, six people in each of the groups. And it was a mix between Smidari's class and Jeannie and my class. Um, because of just how the, we didn't want to have a lot of, I think I ended up with 11 in my class, Jeannie 16. had 16, and Smidar had like 25. Mm -hmm. So that's how we worked out the discussion groups. So yeah, and, and, and that's where some of the, I think the, lo the logistical things kind of fell down that we really need to work on. Mm -hmm. So um, the American students reviewed websites about Israel and set, sent what, and shared what they've learned about Israel on the website. The Israel students didn't. Okay? So you can see here several quotes. Yeah, I would, that was one thing I was just very concerned about in terms of developing the relationship between the two countries is that I knew my students, most of them really did not know anything about Israel. So I thought that would be a good way for them to start accessing information from the websites um, in terms of what they know. And that was shared, actually. Jeannie and I had the, as Jeannie was saying, is we met on Mondays and Thursdays during the month of May. And that was between 4.30 and 8 o'clock at night. And Jeannie and I video conferenced for the first hour of that class. So that's, so we shared together what we were learning about um, Israel. Okay, so this is, the students shared, the American students shared their learnings of Israel. And then Smadar was very patient. And I think I went over, she had commented so many times on each of the students' uh, learning. And that's an example of one of the comments. And this is uh, an interchange of thoughts between uh, Lori mm -hmm. and Marcus, mm -hmm. one of the students. Okay? This touched a really, um, this touched something in me because I was over in England and had very close friends and they had been over in Israel and they were actually supporting, there, had, there has been a movement that um, professors shouldn't go to Israel, professors from other countries shouldn't go to Israel um, until they recognize the Palestinian state. And my husband and I were very upset with very close friends that we had that were recognizing um, this viewpoint and supporting this viewpoint because these were professors in England. Um, so when I was, um, you know, and, the, and I was very conscious of, you know, people, they're learning about Israel through newspaper articles and they weren't getting the full story. And I was trying to think about, okay, what is my role as a professor to um, kind of mediate some of this, navigate people's understanding. So this was kind of the best I could do right now. In an email. The, last, the last sentence, if Lori's suggestion. If you pursue this with your Israeli members, understand that there are different perspectives. Okay? So that was very um, good, Cal. Yes. <clears throat> One of the motivations for creating the Global Learning Partnership
partnership was the fact that when we create papers, as is evidence in what we do for Kenya, by having including our Israeli partners on the paper, they were now getting a chance or more opportunities to participate in organizations that might otherwise not have allowed it. Yes. And so this was intentional uh, from the very beginning. I, when, when I this, um, had my thoughts about the, the conference, I went on and read about what, what is reconstruction, reconstructing early childhood education. Uh -huh. And I'd seen that these uh, conferences were in Palestine about five years ago mm -hmm. and in other places in which I would never have thought of going. So, Okay, so why the book project? Okay, one of my students wrote me this um, message. In my kindergarten, uh, this is just a translation of what you said. There is a child with a development impairment, uh, the, the, uh, the child with a development impairment, and mainstream during the afternoon. The other kids are growing up and they really don't know how to treat her. They begin to have reservations about her and laugh at her. Do you know a good book or any other way to address this issue? Okay. So this is, this is why we chose the book project. And as I said earlier this week, the books are mirrors and windows. And they enable, enable um, a discourse and a dialogue about knowledge of the other. I suspect you implemented the, the student in your talk, no? No. No? Implemented? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, okay, the book sharing project included several stages. The first one is the four students, two of each culture, choose a book and they rush among their choice. The second stage is they discuss their planning, their lesson plan, okay? What they're going to do with the book, and then they put on the web their project and lesson plan, okay? So these are the books that were chosen. And I want to, uh, this was kind of our, when we got back, when I got back to the United States after our visit, and we really started planning, this was really the first thing that we really worked on was, and the idea was that the Israelis would choose two books, children's books, that they could implement, you know, be as part of the project, and that we as the Americans would implement this. And this is where Evie was very helpful because Evie is at OSU, she is our support of our international project. But Evie has a deep, rich, um, she's a scholar in terms of early childhood um, literature, young adult literature, you know, she said she's been so involved in this. So she was very helpful in helping me kind of think through, you know, which um, books that we had. And um, so the ones that, that, the, that the Americans introduced, um, was the, I think, the Susan Lass, and Susan, and we'll pass the books around, but Susan Lass looks like anybody else as you're reading about the book. You don't realize that Susan Lass is in a wheelchair until the very end of the book. And, and that was, um, and that was one of the ways that we thought this was really good because it really, we want to kind of create with students that their students with special rights are more similar than they are different. So we, we chose that. And then the other one we chose was my brother Charlie. And, the, and we had to be thinking about what good literature that really addresses either children with special rights or um, just a difference in general that is good multicultural education. And if you flip through, we did go through, we have a criteria that we did use and we taught people 
how to do this. And my brother Charlie is um, of an African American football player. What better stuff in the United States to show a football player's family who has had twins, and one of the twins has aut autistic um, characteristics. So we decided to choose this, but we really negotiated with um, the Israelis because we couldn't find the book in, in um, uh, Hebrew. So we, I know Evie, you did Scholastic. We had, we were gonna work out something with Scholastic and we had to get Scholastic rights so we could use the book in the project. Um, and, and then you decided yeah, to... We scanned the book and then we translated it. Yes. So before, but no, no Israel student. Right. Now, none of the Israel students chose this book. <laughs> That's <laughs> interesting. Yes. yes. <laughs> Do you have permission to translate? Um, yeah, I think we had tra yeah, permission to translate, to use it for educational purposes. Mm -hmm. As long as they weren't going to sell it. Right. Yes. As, yeah. as long as they were going to use it just for their class, you know, this class. Right. So this is an example of, of something else. Do you want to show something? Yes. Do you want to talk about something else? No. Okay. okay. Um, All right. The, the, um, the, other, the book that the Israelis, um, that Smidar and um, Rachel and others had chosen, was called Something Else. And Something Else tries to be like everyone else. <laughs> But everything he does shows how different he is. Then one night, something shows up. <laughs> Has something else finally met someone just like himself? <laughs> and, um, and it was interesting because the students, my students were looking at this and saying they had never really known about this book. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them used they it liked and it. liked it. They, they really enjoyed it. So. Um, Yes. Yeah, so yes. I think I think uh, uh, many of my students use this book. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think it's uh, their first. Uh, by the way, I I can start and I can't see the PowerPoint. Oh. Oh, John, we'll share again. Okay. This is um. A long, this is. I'm sorry. Just go out and sure. yeah. Go go open her. That's it. You can keep talking, she'll get it. Okay, the next slide. <laughs> well, while you're doing that, pass to something else. Yeah, okay. Where were you, Raquel? I don't know. No, I don't know. She was down to the books. I'll comment real quick while yeah. we're in yeah. transition to the other. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And then the next one below that, the criteria right there. Yeah, you got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, this is okay. You got it, Rebecca, can you see? Okay. Yes. This is the original text the students sent. Uh, this is Malka as well, my favorite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what the students were to do, and I think the activity differed a little between the Americans and the Israelis, but we're in the, the students were, gonna were to take this book and read it either to a small group or to the whole class. In their, in their placements. And um, some of the students, especially in, um, at Walsh, they already had classrooms that they just you know, did, this, did the activity in. And Orinian College, the pre-service teachers had placements where they were, so they implemented them. So the idea was to take a book and they selected together within their discussion groups, a book that they would use, and they would implement the book to the small group or the whole class using universal design of learning principles that all of us used as a framework for how to implement inclusive practices in general education settings. So, and then what they did is they reported, they reflected on the assignment in specific ways, and they and then they posted that reflection to the um, to the discussion. This board. is a lesson plan, but no, notice there are a lot of grammar mistakes. I left it as it is. It didn't bother Marka 
that she was writing with uh, grammatical mistakes because she knew that the American students would understand her. And this is uh, the simplicity of the lesson plan. And this is too long, but I really want you, this is the reflection she had shared on the site. This is her, her own writing, okay? Look at, if you can look at the second uh, paragraph, I felt so, first of all, uh, the student, up until she had uh, done the activity, the student never, the uh, children never asked her why she had a different color, skin color. <laughs> and she was bothered by that. But following the activity, they started to be more intimate with her. They asked her about her color, and she felt so secure in, in a place where people are asking her why she has a different color. So she wrote reflection on that, and look at the, I've colored the Hebrew sentence, okay? She just didn't know how to write that to me. She was code switching. Okay. <laughs> so she left it in Hebrew. Okay. And she did ask for help, but she meant we can understand from her writing that this is what she meant to write. Okay. So this is how comfortable she felt with her writing. So that's, although it's an obstacle, if we do get a certain intimacy between the students abroad, uh, the students in Israel and in the state, the language can be bridged. Okay? But this is my This reminds me, I, had, um, I have a doctoral student from Kenya who has um, who had polio from a, a very early age, and he's in a wheelchair. Um, so he goes into, he does his assignment, uh, this assignment in early childhood setting. And he comes, the kids were just in love with him. They were taking him all over the place, wheeling him all over. I'm surprised after meeting him. In, um, you know, in, in outside, and they didn't want him to go. And he comes back to um, class and he says, Dr. Katz, where did the kids learn stereotypes? Because they sure didn't, you know, they were just so loving and welcoming. And, you know, where, where were all the stereotypes that they, you know, that comes across later on in life? And um, so the reactions were really, um, were nice on a, you know, both a personal standpoint. So following the shared reflection set, the other students reflected on the other's reflection. Okay, so this is um, one of the students, Noam, and she was, um, I haven't quoted her reflection, but you can see how she addresses the sun. She takes it very serious. Hello everyone, I identify with the, with the activity and my insights following this project. In Hebrew, okay, because Leon the Cameron in Hebrew is not a male, Leon, it's a female, it's Hagit, a Zikit. Because uh, of this is kind of a linguistic game, okay? So she says in Hebrew the name of the camel is Chagit to clarify why the, 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 they were dressed as a female. It was the, the character was dressed as a female. I hope reading this will contribute to you, to you too. Always happy to hear uh, follow the mistakes and she's not bothered. The spelling is Give your opinion, thought. And feedback, norm and the smile, the smile face. Okay, and this is the reaction of the, the American students. It was a pleasure reading your reflection, Noam. I like how you intended for the class to pretend they were cameras to accomplish your goal for the project. I also like how you encourage the class to talk amongst themselves, to become aware of the aware of the differences amongst us. This is a reaction. This was interesting, and Jeannie and I talked about this because the students were asking, well, how do I respond to their activities? So we, um, we did some modeling. Um, you know, we talked about, you know, obviously there's no one right way to, to do this. You want to reinforce them, and, um, and I think that came across pretty well. And this is, um, the, the Israeli students really appreciated the, the responses that were very detailed, okay, that didn't end 
with all your deep breath and that's it. Okay? They were worried of the length of the response. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can see how empathetic uh, this student is, the American student. I hope things work out for you. This is so encouraging. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, this is the study I'm going to do 10 minutes. I'm going to do this very quick and, and uh, maybe we'll just say that we, we had two American uh, courses and one Israeli class and my book was a control book because we didn't interact with the other, uh, with the other culture. So, just to be quick, this is a very, this is an in -depth, a mixed procedure. Oh, John. Oh. Oh. That? Oh. Yeah, that's not. Okay. So we did the quantitative and qualitative uh, analysis. Uh, uh, Lauren will speak very briefly about the quantitative. I, I did the qualitative um, well, section, which included individual in the semi structured interview, open questions at the beginning of the course, open questions at the end of the course. Students written reflection, instructors written, uh, written reflections, focus group, which all of us did, and I followed all the written correspondence online. Okay? And that's the, the result of the yeah. quantitative. What we were trying to do is, um, with the quantitative measures, the, um, look at the the participants' dispositions towards inclusion and how they felt about implementing inclusive practices. And quite honestly, the results were very favorable all, all over, you know, from pre and post. There was definitely an increase in the post in terms of their dispositions towards working with kids with special rights and efficacy. So that was that was very positive. So um, on the qualitative, what we found out is that we couldn't relate the cross-cultural study, the cross-cultural uh, in terms of location, to change in attitude and sense of, sense of self-efficacy. So what we did, we did the uh, uh, qualitative study. And what we found out, we found several things. The first thing which Regards motivation, we found out that there was there were high motiv there was high motivation in the beginning of the course, and then as the course went on and students found it difficult to interact with each other, the motivation almost ended. So it, it became it became uh, an unwanted experience. Okay, and you have expectations uh, supporting that disappointed. Disappointment. It was a great disappointment uh, of the interaction, and I think it was maybe the framework was not not clear enough. Okay, mm -hmm. and we need to speak about that. Uh, knowledge uh, through the interviews, we've learned that the Israeli students have little knowledge about inclusion and inclusion in Israel. They had no knowledge about inclusion in the USA. Um, very limited knowledge about children with special rights, very limited knowledge about inclusive practices, including how to work collaboratively with uh, staff and parents. And we found out that the source of knowledge was mainly based on the life work experience, the experience they had, not on theory. Um, we found challenges. We found that language in time was a barrier, technology was a barrier. Time differences was uh, creating difficulties. Gaps in age, experience, and educational degree was creating difficulties. Not seeing things. The students read the lesson plan, but they didn't see any pictures of what was what went on. And so, one of the students said, I understand what you want, but I can't say whether that's right or wrong because I couldn't see that. And the Israeli students said that the choice of books was limited and they were missing the Israeli book. Okay. Uh, student responsiveness was a very a strong thing. The Israeli students said they were very keen to get involved with the student, but the responsiveness, the, the American responsiveness was very low. Okay? And the experience was very intensified. And so a short period. Short period.
you a very large number of assignments um, and they kept, kept on saying that if it was a year it wouldn't be a better um, experience course. They did speak about learning from others, the opportunities of the course. They did mention all through the course that they wanted to learn from the Americans but because they had better experience with inclusion. It was very important for them. And these are several quotes, yes. and the book project was a success. Mm -hmm. But they thought they needed more time, that it was too bad it was only a one-time experience. They wanted more with the book project. We had problems with the videos, but they were they related mostly to the Israeli videos. And there wasn't enough time to watch the videos, okay, the other videos, because it was such a so Well, they had them in their uh, elements to see any time they wanted. Yeah, but, but they were converted, uh, translated. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So something about the, the, the written correspondence, our students found it difficult because uh, it, was, it, it was difficult for them to write in English. So most of the correspondence was among the American students. And I looked at the, the discussions between the Americans and they had extended their discussions and they actually uh, really shared knowledge amongst each other, which didn't happen with the Israelis. Um, with the Israelis, the correspondence focused mainly on pure descriptions, pure facts, there was no expansion, no discussion about inclusive things or dilemmas, pedagogical difficulties, only in very little, very, uh, like very um, individual cases. And there was hardly any use of photographs or any other visual document, which was too bad. Um, on the wall, okay, there was a change in attitudes towards inclusion and teaching highly diverse classes. Class. The Israeli students still feel as if they are weak in the practical aspects. The Israeli students mostly related their growing sense of confidence to the activities done and thought within their own class. They do not relate these learnings to the global learning project and the Israeli students have positive attitudes towards interaction with the American students. They need more help and guidance. So this is this point. I'm not going to speak about the, what I think the recommendations are. I'm going to go to you. Well, we'll invite like Smadar to yeah. stop. They start mm -hmm. coming in now. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, and then we'll go from there. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, Smadar, do you have comments about this, uh, where we are right now? Well, I think we did a lot, and the course was uh, very significant for us teachers. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 <laughs> okay. Um, um, and I think the students um, as well. Um, I think two main challenges for my students uh, were that the technology and I think that, that you saw in the quote that they were just not having time to see the videos and so on uh, was because I ended up spending a lot of class time um, in order to help to deal with technology. And this was, I think, a bit frustrating for me as well as for them. And the other real challenge was the language. Um, they were very concerned about language, and we ended up talking a lot about that. And then, um, when they started to be with with American students, they felt kind of overhanded. Also, for the, for some of the students, like I think Marcus, who, who if I remember correctly, is the uh, lower PhD student, would write responses that are like three pages long each. Yes. 
Theo, that was Theo, yes. <laughs> and that was, you know, it was hard for them to follow that level of language, and they also felt that they won't be able to respond in that level, not in the level of the language and not in the leg. And then, so that was just something that we need to think about how to do this more and say, because it's not, it's not like they're talking or writing in English with you know, people from the Netherlands or from uh, a non-English speaking country. I think this, this whole notion of this for them, second language, is your students, like Keith and Lori, first, the first language, was all the time a huge concern. And even now, uh, uh, I already have students that are enlisted in my course. For, for this year, the, that are coming to me with concerns, how do I take this course? I heard it's, a, it's very difficult uh, English wise. Um, so, this is something that we need to deal with. And, and going back to the technology, I felt, and I already you know, wrote it down in my reflection, that using uh, the site for and also for the communication between all the students who was all confused because some of them assignments were only for your students and my students weren't sure do I need to do this, do, don't tend to do this. So I think these are the main the main to come by. But I think that since we all did it one time, these are things that we can overcome. And now that we have the experience and, and first time, um, the videos, the American videos have been translated, so they should be, you know, very available to my students. And I think we, we can take it to a level for our students uh, to really interact to feel that they are getting something out of the interaction. Uh, if we really put all the parts together and yeah. make it it's more in sync than the first course. But again, when I'm thinking that the first time we did it, I think also it was different, even though there were some problems. Anybody have questions? Yeah, oh, there's a other comments. I know Moshe, you have opinions about technology and how it works. And, and Brother Pius and, and uh, Brother Dennis, maybe you have some comments because you know you have ideas about going back to Uganda and taking courses back with you. So what what do you think? Input from anybody? Well I just wondered what in terms of trying to get the dialogue going better between the students in, in each of those classrooms, what were some things you're planning to, to do to try to encourage one thing, we were talking about trying to have maybe some times where they could connect. You know, that's, that's one option to look at, at, at some common times, even if it's a couple of times where they could meet each other. But also look at the platform we use. Um, I know we've talked to John Gornack a little bit and, and each other, and we talked last night a little bit too, to see if, because we used, you know, Ohio State was gracious in offering their management system. But the Wall students, for example, had to get into that system. And it was one of those worlds colliding. Our email system changed at the same time. Um, it was just complexities that caused some delays. So I think if we can do that early on now and prevent some of those problems that, I mean, things I hadn't thought of. You know, I thought it would be easy. And it took me a while. And, and, and like with, we used um, Adobe Connect. And going through another university system, Ohio State, for me here at Walsh was a little more complicated. And so we just, we learned a lot. I think we can remediate that. Um, we, I know we talked, Rich and I talked briefly last night and we didn't talk to Lori about it, but I think you've had the conversations too of sharing what they're doing. If they could see a lesson, like I was thinking if we had um, an iPad app like iMovie and they would go into a score, any app, and, you know, an app or a video, whatever, and take a movie of the lesson they taught and we could Load it somewhere so they could watch each other teaching. Because one of the things I regret is when I got to go to Israel and I, saw, you know, Gary and I, we saw so many wonderful learning environments, and our students 
here didn't get to experience that. So I would like to see that sharing. So I think there are things that are very um, easy to fix if we just sit and brainstorm and come up with. You know, I, I guess it's becoming more simple instead of sometimes more complex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we tried to, um, OSU wanted us to use Adobe Connect. They called it Carmen Connect. And I thought, okay, well, let's, the, the um, I had all the instructors on the Carmen Connect. And that was not easy. And so, of course, the students were having problems. So I would not, I'd do away with Carmen Connect. And either have them go through Skype you know, Google, I mean, whatever, Facebook, whatever's going on, you know, whatever works for them, I think, to do that. Um, in terms of videotaping the lessons, the, the issues with that in the States sometimes is the consents. And, um, but often they can do pictures, and we do do a lot of documentation, so I think we could have pictures uploaded you know, for those that could do it. Um, you know, but yeah, so I think that the other thing we thought about is maybe um, the students wanted to learn more about Smidar and what she was doing. And the thinking was, well, then maybe as professors who's ever teaching the courses that we could actually video, have ourselves videotaped and uploaded, and Jeannie and I were thinking that wouldn't it be interesting to kind of share about, you know, inclusion in the United States through our perspectives mm -hmm. and where we have come, because in a sense those are two different stories with the same full legislation and laws and, and things like that. And then that could also be, um, you know, with Smidar and, and um, Rachel or whoever's going to be involved, you know, doing doing that as well. Or maybe there is a strength, you know, you know, smidar of, you know, you're a psychologist. So that might be um, really good to talk about special ed from a psychologist's point of view. I mean, I think there's some really a lot of issues in terms of teachers understanding families who have, who raise special rights, children with special rights, and some of the issues. And I can really see <coughs> Smidar's, you know, psychological backgrounds and expertise coming through that, that might be really good. Because I wouldn't necessarily, you know, share it from that kind of perspective. So that's just to kind of throw out. Yes, and also, uh Last year we couldn't do it because of the time differences, but maybe this year I think we will be able to visit, you know, uh, using Skype or whatever and teach other class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would really be good. Yeah, me too. That we could, um, yeah, that we could arrange that. I think we still have that time difference that's really critical, but. We could do the videotapes, and then that way people can view them at different times. That might be a way. Okay. Yes. Share a few thoughts. First of all, I enjoy the team of you working. Okay. In such a, a friendly and a happy way. The impression I get from the outside that you love what you're doing, that you enjoy what you're what, what doing. I think this is such a cheap that we have a joint team working together. And maybe one of the best products can be a joint writing. Now well, inputs, your inputs, your input, and it is some kind of a build a basic, uh, theoretical basis for what you, you are doing without letting the students interfere you. Just among uh, four, five, six of you working, working together, dealing with the availability of literature, dealing with the theoretical issues, so, uh, and so on. Then, of course, technology is present all the time. My suggestion is at the beginning, keep the technology at the minimum. The minimum. 
and experiment new technology among themselves or with a very small group of students. In a certain times, I used to run a whole course just using email and attachments. Because everyone has Gmail now, and they're just sharing documents by email. Everyone can master that technology and, and so on. And then a little bit, don't make the technology, the technology to take 80% of your energy. Sometimes that's what happens. We are all engaged in working technology. And uh, I think there are uh, a few other issues here that we should have. Uh, at the beginning, an hour ago, you discussed the, the introduction phase. And there is a whole issue how we build a group. And you have to define in the curriculum two weeks, three weeks, of building the, the learning group. How to introduce yourselves, what you send over. Uh, in the book sharing project, 100 years ago, we learned to do it, to write IDs, ID articles about the, the children, and exchange letters, and so on, and pictures, and, but make it in a limited, part of the uh, phase of, 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 of the program and there we, among the kids the tendency to ask what is your music, what you are doing, what is your habit, how is your dog, how is your cat, students were, are ready to discuss it the whole semester. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, cats occupied two weeks of our time <laughs> and then we are moving to, to, to our topic. But how you introduce yourself online. Mm -hmm. In my book there is a whole chapter on that, but what is online identity? You add a picture or not? I found out that the students are ready to tell intimate details about themselves, but very precious about putting online a photograph. <laughs> so, but I think the photograph is needed, and uh, but you have to think about how we make introduction and how we build a, a learning group. I'm not sure how it was now, but in the far future, we don't have three classrooms working together. The idea is to have one classroom working together with teachers, professors from different areas. For example, if I teach online at the Graz College in Philadelphia, my students are all over the world. I had one student in Alexandria, Egypt, studying with me through grad college in, in Philadelphia. So, but we had one class, not three classes working together. And you should, I think you should try to build one working group, not dealing with three working groups that coordinate the work and whatever, because it, it draws a lot of energies from you. A lot of coordination, a lot of... Uh, you sh we should try, it will take time, maybe not this year, and also my advice to other courses, try to build one class, one learning. Not remain in a, a situation that we have three distinct groups that sometimes interact. But we have one, at the virtual agora, one studying group working together. And then you said very seriously, People are not all the time are responsive and quick enough. The most common question among the internet in the last 20 years is for sure now, the most frequent question is why he didn't answer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Every one of us faces this question. Why I send him a letter? Why he or she is not uh, just immediately responding or not? And then they answer, he doesn't like me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember that at uh, the book sharing project, we had such a stage and I got an angry letter from an American teacher. My Israeli partner, she's awful, she doesn't respect our time and so on. But the fact was that for that week, they were sitting in a bomb shelter. Mm -hmm. I don't know if one. Yeah. They couldn't respond. Right. So, Sounds like a good reason. 
<laughs> so, 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 but you, you have to put it on the table and to require good responses, and and uh, on a weekly basis. I, in my online courses at our name, I'm telling my students you have you can respond in your time, but in the framework of one week. You cannot just delay it uh, forever. So the course must have a pace, otherwise it loses itself. So no, you can answer. You know, uh, okay, thank you. I'm gonna get yes, back to you. you in, you know, give any right indication that you are there. Yeah, that, 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 that you are there. But it, it's a very, very demanding issue. You have to be responsible. Yeah, because basically you're, you're running into the issue of trust. You know, you're building a relationship. And until you trust each other, you know, I didn't hear from you when I expected to hear from you. I would call you because I think, oh my God, the bombs are coming. He's had a wreck. It's like almost too crazy, you know? But that's a different level of trust. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then in my family culture, when my daughter is calling me from Austria now, she's calling, Moshe, do you hear me? Tornich, <laughs> 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 I offer one of them. part of the developing the online skills that we don't have yet and we have to okay you have the time a week to answer but you have to answer or you got to give an indication that you are there. English great that is a problem because until now English in Israeli uh, academic institution is a punishment. Why you have to learn English? Just because the dean demands it. Now it, it becomes a real issue of life, a real requirement. So I believe it from year to year and the word is spreading that we learn English because there are a few people around the world who also speak, speak English. And it becomes uh, an authentic response. And I hope you change the attitude to English until you will start learning English. Right. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, we are going to take a short break for, for this necessary purposes and we can be probably at two o'clock and Dr. One, 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 more, oh, okay. one, one more comment. Yeah. There is also something that we can learn from the experience of the book show project we discussed tomorrow morning. How we how we process together a book. How we if we are having a book, you said it's a wonderful activity to select the book. But then once you selected the book, how you process a book in a week time or two weeks time period? How you do something about it together? It's a very important issue. How you read it together? How you share it together? I, I, I think you should add to your curriculum a, compo a component about reading together a book in an online community. Uh, uh, something like that. I mean, it, it's a new issue. Mm -hmm. And they have quite a bit of um, uh, research experience in the areas. But I'm, I'm very happy that uh, what you, 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 you achieved until now. And I believe it is very important to our college. All right, so 2 o'clock, we start with Dr. Tickerman and Dr. Gary Jacobs, and they will be talking about the principal's leadership course, and that will complete our day. Frida, okay. are you going to say goodbye to Smadar? Or Smadar! Maybe <laughs> she wants to say with us, she can. If you don't, we understand. Bye, <laughs> guys! Okay. Good night, dear. Thank you. Zero.
Okay? Does that help? And I know Dr. Boak has encouraged many of the Walsh faculty to be present tomorrow. So that it really will be a meeting. Mm -hmm. And would you please introduce yourself? Okay, um, my name is Tori Betts. And I'm a student at Walsh. Very nice. And you're very welcome. We're so glad you gave up this beautiful Saturday <laughs> afternoon to be with us. Well, if you would check us, uh, you're leaving tomorrow night, right? So bring your bags up, check out the morning, bring your bags over, and then when we're done, you'll come to our house, and then we'll figure out where we're going to Cleveland. And we have to take the cells to the mall. self-assessment, one-on-one with faculty um, to identify leadership skills and administrators need to enrich or develop or to become successful transformational leaders. And they're going to work um, with faculty from, of course, Walsh University, University of Colorado Denver, and Learning um, Academic College um, in Israel. And we'll work with other students for each university to collaborate um, on projects and related leadership development. So that's just in a nutshell the course description of And then, of course, the faculty, you know, uh, Rodney and Itzik and I. So. Um, and then some objectives, I mean, there probably are more, but there were some that we um, kind of thought about. <laughs> um, you know, evaluate and explore our own leadership styles. Um, and we're going to uh, talk about some of the activities that will help get to that in, in just a few minutes. Um, Identify leadership styles that they presently use most often. You know, what is it that, you know, why do they use them? Um, and then develop leadership styles that move them toward transformational leadership. Um, and then learn how to develop the leadership of their own faculty or colleagues in their school or business. You know, based on hopefully they can take away from the course. Yeah, I want to I wanna add something. Um, actually, uh, you know, every student that come to the course, uh, know at least something about himself or herself and about what did they achieve until now regarding leadership or ability to influence others or to lead them or, or maybe something else which is to manage them, which is totally different, you know, managing and, and leading is two, two, two different uh, phenomena. But sometimes students and others tend to mix between them. And, and, and basically, it's, it's, they are totally different because uh, uh, managerial abilities actually it's something that come from outside us. It's, it's employed a more of external motivation. And because someone um, give us a job or a duty or whatever, and it's not that I decide for myself that I want to be a manager. Someone had to appoint me as a manager, and then I had to start managing whatever I manage. Uh, leadership is something that develops from the inside. It's something that I feel from the inside that it's important for me to, um, to come up with whatever ideas or values or everything that I believe in and I would like to uh, influence others. I care about what's going on in 
it's about responsibility, involvement. I want to be involved in what's going on. I want to influence. I want to uh, to uh, come with my voice or ideas, and and I want to do something to the people around me because I believe I have something to offer. And, and leadership is something that that uh, comes from the inside, but. It's not always clear to us why it's so important for us to try to influence others or try to be that much involved in whatever going on around us. So uh, one of the uh, main things uh, that we're going to deal with uh, during uh, the course is to help our students to understand their motivation, their own motivation, and why it's so important for them to influence others. Or um, in, in a different uh, way, you know, one of the books that we're going to use is On Becoming a Leader by Warren Bates. This is a very good one. Uh, I used to use it. This is the revised um, uh, edition, 2009. And, um, and chapter three, which we usually study very thoroughly, is is um, uh, the headline of the chapter is knowing yourself. And one of the things that he wrote it down. One of the things that um, he said that is uh, know yourself means separating who you are and who you want to be from what the world thinks you are and wants you to be. Mm -hmm. And this is very important because many, th many times we, we tend to mix between what others expect us to do and what really important for us to do. And we think uh, what they expect us is that what we want, but it's wrong. And if we don't make it clear for us what really are our really motivation, um, and, and what is important to us. And we try to answer the question, why is important to us? And, and this process is not uh, easy. And many times students come to the class, and uh, they think they know about it, and they think they know about their leadership style, whatever, because they have some experience. And, and as I said yesterday, um, the average uh, in our classes, and the average uh, age is, is around 40, almost 41. Mm -hmm. and, and the average um, experience uh, years in, in the education system is around 14. So they did something and they, they acquired some experience and they believe they know, you know what motivates them and what is important to them. And it's not easy to challenge it. So uh, actually using uh, Jack's story from, from yesterday with the mule, uh, one way is to, to shake uh, their um, knowing or beliefs is to give them a kind of a picture. Um, I can't say, you know, the, the real, but something which close to a real picture of them using their colleagues, wherever they work, whatever school, that evaluate them according to the, the, um, the model, the um, full range leadership model by Basel and Volio. So they have to evaluate themselves and they give it to at least five people that know them. And they consider they know them. And they evaluate them according to all eight I mean, it doesn't, it's not uh, divided by eight, but later, you know, when we analyze it, eight different uh, <laughs> leadership styles, some of them are transformational leadership style, but some of them are a transactional leadership style, using, you know, the reward and punishment and so on. And many times, it's happened to me with, with our students, they are amazed to see how much transactional leadership they use how much reward and punishment they use. Mm -hmm. They thought they are much more, you know, transformational. Mm -hmm. And the picture is not that. And even though they give those questionnaires to people they, they trust, you know, 
because it's up to them to decide to whom give the question here to answer. Uh, yet, the picture always surprises And This is the, the hit in the face in order to get some attention. <laughs> you know, once they see that the picture is not exactly as they thought, they say, okay, maybe yeah, there is something that we can learn here. And we really, um, actually what the course I try to do um, is really um, to uh, allow them um, to, uh, to study or to re-evaluate or to look at it from different angles, the ways they do things, the, the, the ways they, they get their decisions, what is important to them, uh, according to what, what values they make their decisions, and why. Why these values are so important to you, and, and why other values are not, and, and what, how that, you know, the picture that you, you just uh, got after analyzing all those questionnaires, uh, actually uh, go along with your experience at school. And, um, and after they, they are uh, receiving, it's, it's going to be toward the first, at the end of the first semester. The second semester, after, you know, we sit there, but that's what we plan to do here too. Uh, I personally sit with each and every student for an hour during semester break. And we decide on a working plan for each and one of them. And out of the picture that they receive, the feedback picture, they decide to pick up two leadership styles out of the eight uh, leadership styles that they want to improve. And the, the second semester, they start to work on it wherever they work, in the school that, where they teach. They start to work on those two leadership styles. And they have to write a reflective diary. Everything that happened to them during work. There was a meeting and I tried to, to use, uh, for instance, uh, an intellectual challenge and to come up with, uh, or to, to give room, if I am the one who, who leads the meeting, to give room to new ideas and to be ready to challenge my own concepts and so on. And what happened during the meeting? What did I succeed and what I didn't and why? What I seen? And everything they write in there. And this, those um, reflective diaries are amazing. You know, I just finished reading uh, this year's um, essays and I'm talking about, say, 50, 60, sometimes 70 pages mm -hmm. of reflective diary that they write everything. You know, the good diaries, not all of them are, you know, the same level. But some students are very good in reflection. And, and you can see um, how they learn from, from one event to the next one and how they um, actually uh, develop and, and, and going forward and, and change their behavior, their leadership behavior and became more and more transformational. So this is a basic thing that um, student will, will come to this course, or take this course. For us, it's a, a mandatory, it's a required course. For Walsh and, and, uh, and Colorado, it's, um, you know, they have to choose it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not obvious yet. I, I already know that uh, I have 25 students. Mm -hmm. Actually, I have 50, but I divide them always to two because it's kind of, um, some sessions are more uh, like a workshop session. You can't work with more than even 20 is too much. And so only one group out of these two are going to be part of this course. The other one is going to run in a regular way only, only um, for an in. So we'll be able, always we'll be able to compare. And um, I hope, you know, for Walsh we're going to have at least then, <laughs> then um, because we, we one of the one of the methods that we 
like to employ is to form groups of students. Now, at the beginning, we thought of two, two from each university, because we didn't want them to be by themselves, you know, it's a bit lonely, and with the English and so on. So at least you have a body next to you and together, you know, so we, we, we were thinking of forming a six student group, and they will start to work together on a mission. Okay, you want to go ahead? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we, those are the, we have the, the on-becoming leader and then the full-range um, leadership development by Amolio. Yeah, Amolio. This is, this is one of the textbooks that we're going to use. And uh, for us, by the way, just one second. Sure. For us, um, no, because we have uh, a book that um, was uh, edited by myself and my colleague. And I know uh, uh, Professor Avolio, and we actually invited him and Professor Bass when he was still alive. And uh, they came a few times to Israel. They are good uh, friends of us. And, and actually they help us um, also to develop um, 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 a method for the army uh, commanders as well. And uh, so he wrote, uh, Professor Avorio wrote uh, an essay especially for our book. We translated it to Hebrew and it's in our book and the students use the, the Hebrew version of something. But now for this course they will have to use this one in English. <laughs> Um, and then we have some other supplemental ones we may look at, and the Bass one we're going to use um, information from, and there's uh, actually Bass and, and Lugio, um, and the Transformational Leadership, and some a few others there that I added that I've been looking at. Um, we looked at um, some dates that we would meet with the course, and so these we're just kind of looking at. The first one is when it's offered here at, at Walsh, because um, this semester I have to do it on Wednesday and they're doing theirs on the Thursday <laughs> because of my teaching schedule right now. I have another class on Thursday night. But um, we're going to have two different video conference times and those will be Sundays. Um, we're going to meet for three hours. Sunday evening for us yeah. from 7 o'clock, 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. 7 p.m. Yeah, p.m., sorry. 7 p.m. <laughs> 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. in Israel. Right here it will be? Um, noon. 12. 12 to 3 and, and, and Colorado going to be well, let know 10, <laughs> Colorado going to be 10 or 9 o'clock? 9 hours. Two, three, three, two, two hours. Two, two hours, hours different. From us, we have to be 10. Yeah. 10 hours. So, um, so this is the plan right now and then we'll just move on to two video conference times. Um, and then some of the course content, um, it's if we're talking about you know, the questionnaire, um, that they'll individually do it for themselves um, based on the MLQ questions. MLQ question. And then that same qu uh, questionnaire will go out to the, you know, like we said, anywhere between five to ten people that they know. We go out to them and then it would come back to the instructor. It wouldn't go back to the student. So that person who's yeah. filling it out would not feel like, oh, the student's going to see how I respond. It would just come back to, to us. Um, and then there's a statistical analysis is that done, is done, and then from that they get feedback on the different you know, leadership styles that are there, you know, transaction and transformation. Um, and then um, some other things with like the full range leadership model can be um, go take them through that. Um, and then the critical incident activity on the human attack. Well, critical um, leadership incident is a technique that. Um, that I use is that every student asks to uh, choose from his history. Could be something that happened to him or her mm -hmm. 10 years ago or something that happened just yesterday. But something that he considers critical. And, and one of the important things that we would like to understand when this student, first he has to to, to write uh, like a, a one to two pages describing these incidents. Uh, and then uh, we let him um, uh, share it with the class. And people can start asking him or her 
question about the event and what exactly happened and, and, and what was his role and did he have a formal role in this incident or something that he initiated something by himself and how the other reacted to what he did and why he considered it crucial and so on. So this is a chance for, uh, for everybody to listen to something that I feel is crucial. And, and we would like to use the, the first video conference. Every video conference is supposed to be three hours because you know it, it takes time until everything is okay with technology and everything. Take care of We'll be coffee. But once once you said it, we want to uh, make it uh, you know. And then um, students from all three universities can ask these uh, students that just. Um, share with the class uh, his uh, critical uh, leadership incident, they can ask him questions, you know. So this student can get questions from all over. And I believe that the kind of question that someone from Walsh will be different from the question uh, from his colleague from Israel and going to be different from questions that might come from Colorado. Because different people, different cultures tend to see different things and come up with different experience. And this is one, one of the advantages of, of this global learning, that actually um, the students will be able to look at things from much more uh, points of view, much more perspectives. And by employing much more perspective, you'll be able, I believe, to see things that right now sometimes we miss because maybe we look at it only from our experience, our things that we used to. And this is part of, if we talk about um, uh, transformational leadership, this is one of the four uh, sub-leadership uh, style of transformational leadership is the the um, uh, intellectual stimulation. And this is the ability to look at things from different angles, to be ready to, to question your own um, assumptions and your own way of thinking, and to create a kind of, a, um, a kind of, of atmosphere that allows everybody to ask questions and not take anything for granted. And um, we can see, you know, my work, my experience um, working with principals and others that many times they believe that they know already. And sometimes when they have meetings with their colleagues, they, they know already what's going to be the final decision of this meeting. They come up with when their minds are set about something. And, and once they, they start to work on it, and in, in, instead of come with, with answers, they come with questions. Use much more question marks than exclamation marks. And they start asking questions. And, and suddenly they get answer because once their colleagues realize that they really want to know, and their questions are a really question, you know, not just to ask something, you know, to show that, okay, I'm asking questions. But we really want the other to, to state their opinions and, and, and to be part of the, the decision. Every decision, it doesn't matter if you work on your um, vision, the school vision, or of any decision that something you have to decide for tomorrow. And um, so this is, this is a kind of a process and, and, and critical incident is something that uh, will help um, all the students to know a little bit about the others and, and also to deal with real problems because I believe the, the incident, the, the critical leadership incident that they bring to the class, you know, once you, you collect all of them, it will give you a very, a very nice and very uh, comprehensive picture of um, leadership situation. You know, from different uh, areas, different culture, uh, 
um, different schools, you know, high school, elementary school, kindergarten. We have also um, students that um, are heads of kindergartens, you know. Mm -hmm. So they bring the, the stories from the kindergarten. Sometimes it's a bunch, it's, it's, it's a, like a three, four kindergarten, and he is the manager, or she is the manager, mainly of those three, four kindergarten together. So different experience, different setting, and, and once you listen to all of them and you ask questions, you can get um, uh, kind of a knowledge that is important for your leadership that you can't get uh, only uh, if you do it only within the or an imp framework or Walsh or whatever. Um, uh, just another activity, we're going to have like, some case study activities and analysis things that we'll do um, throughout. Um, a collaborative project that we're, we want to do with them, and this is something that will be part of the, last, the second video conference that they'll present at, um, a global leader collaborative project. And so each member of that group of six, two from each of the um, universities where it may be two from Orlean and one from Walton. <laughs> we'll just see how that all works out. Um, we'll decide on someone here she considers to be a leader to them. So it could be a teacher they had, it could be, it could be some famous per, you know, author, someone that they can actually go and interview that person, um, and then from that write an essay, and then as a group they have to decide how they're going to present that, and they have like a 10 minutes just because of time, you know, to present their um, their leader, but in working together in that group. So that's you know, a big part of that um, second video conference. And then as um, Itzik was talking about in terms of identifying two leadership styles and, and the reflection in the daily um, reflective diary, which is actually part of the second course that we're going you know, to need to develop. This is all in development efforts. So. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that um, if we talk about uh, the mission, for the, these uh, six students or four students, whatever we're going to have, um, is that, that they will have to decide together on one leader that they're going to work on and study. And why study this leader? Uh, supposed to be, you know, a kind of a world leader that everybody knows, but there could be one from the history. Um, our history, you know, or current history, whatever, is to try to um, um, find out a, a crucial event. We know, or I, I should start with it. When we study uh, leadership uh, biographies, or leaders' biographies, we always find out that there was a crucial event that really shaped their, uh, the whole perspective, the way they understand uh, whatever going on, they understood their life or whatever. There is one crucial event and, and leaders, leaders talk about it. And we have many examples and, um, that that leaders realize what was this moment that really changed, uh, many times changed their lives. And um, one of the mission of these uh, students together is to try to, to nail this, uh, this uh, moment or this event and try to understand why it was so so important and so crucial in the life of the leader. I remember um, when I when I saw it was many years ago a movie that had been done um, uh, about uh, George Bush father George Bush and uh, he described how he had been shut down during World War II. And he almost lost his life. And he was rescued, you know, last minute rescue. And, and while he was talking uh, to the camera, to the interviewer, uh, this, uh, it was a, a documentary movie. And he said, he explained why that was a crucial moment in his life and why he see it as a crucial moment, what happened around it. And, and we know from the biography of such a moment and you would like to find
define this moment and you would like to understand this moment while understand the whole um, the whole picture and activity and whatever is connected to this here as well. So this is going to be the mission of those uh, six, four to six student groups yeah. that, that will work together from three, um, three universities. At least that's what we plan for them. Mm -hmm. um, so we talked about kind of the, the collaboration in terms of working together um, and in terms of how the you know, online activities, so it might be through email or Skype or Google Hangout is one of the things we're talking about um, using, because everyone have a Google account and be able to do that. Um, another thing that we've talked about is that we know we, can, we have the two video conferences, but that we also each could take a topic, um, each faculty member, and create like a 10 minute video about that topic and then upload that to YouTube and then each of the schools could use that video um, and share that with their students um, when that topic comes up during their course. Um, and then they would you know, have that access and then if there were other supplemental materials and things, those things could be sent to um, each yeah, and they know, they know us. Yes. This is a chance for them to know us. And we choose something that we would like to speak on. And then, um, you know, it's give them a chance to learn something, to know us, and, and this is Another thing, if, if the video will be about the topic or, or, or about the persona? No, about the topic. Yeah, the topic. By us, by the, the three of us. Ah. Each one of us will choose a topic, we'll talk about it 10 minutes, we we'll upload it to YouTube, and they will be able to, you know, open it and watch it, and then they can start, you know, co correspond yeah. with us or open it, you know, wherever. Um, and then, the, of course, in terms of tech, we were thinking like Google Hangout or I know Blue Jeans, we talked about it, but it's most leaning, I think, towards the Google. Yeah, Google we are, we are you, pro Google. Uh, does Google uh, Hangout give you the opportunity to have a discussion board? Yeah. And also to post your videos? Yeah. Okay, so that. And they can work. share things sure. on it too, so. Yeah, and, it, and you can have, you know, if we can have those video conferences using it. We actually, you, we tried it with, with Sari back in mm -hmm. our name. And it's, it's very, very easy to use. Once you have a Google account, it's very easy to use. And it's very efficient. It's Google, you know. The only thing that we have to be careful of is that in the United States, the rules are a little different. So we have to make sure that with our IT people, that we're allowed to use Google Hangout to post things. That's, that's our only problem. That was what we, that's why we were using the LMS. Maybe you could you'd be allowed to use it. Are we allowed yeah, to use it? Yeah, you'd be allowed to use it. Honestly, you're controlling the environment. So you're at, you know, you're controlling who gets added to the course. Okay. So you could you could go ahead and use it. So I that mean, would really be your area. It's honestly an option. Like Walsh has looked at a couple different options for document management mm -hmm. and Google Docs and um, Office 365 were the big two were their way, but universities are using Google Docs and Google Hangouts and so oh. forth too, so there's not an issue there. So then you'll facilitate that. I think 12 schools are using that a lot too. Yeah. Right here, so. Okay, so that that may solve the problem. Did you guys this well? Okay. Perfect one. But it, it worked, you know. Work in progress. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, we want to make that work. It, it might sound that we know everything. No, we know nothing. We have many ideas, and we have the good will. We believe in it, yeah. but from that point, we have only question marks. No, it's a wonderful. But Lori and yeah, Lori and Jeannie and Sarah and Raquel can share with you that they have great sympathy because they know exactly where you. Um, no, it was interesting to hear you talk about, uh, at the very, very beginning, about how to put people in groups because we went through the same um, issue. Should we just do one American with one Israeli or, you know, one... And then we said, no, we have to do two Israelis with two, um, with two Americans. And that was just 
and I think that really worked out, you know, really well. Um, and, and at one point, the way Smidar had her classes, there was one person, we were trying to put another group in there, and no, but none of the Israelis wanted to be alone in another group with the Americans. <laughs> so, um, it was a good lesson, though. Yeah, it was a good lesson. So we, you know, so we um, did that. The other, the other thing I was, I was thinking about is your activity to share, um, to share, um, you know, people share their um, activities, okay. critical, great, great critical activities, activities. activities. Yeah. yeah. And one thing that worked really well with um, Jeannie and I, because we tried all the time, because Jeannie and I were an hour, you know, each at the beginning um, of our classes to get, you know, video conferencing, and we didn't have a lot of kind of back and forth. But where we finally had the back and forth was at the, when um, they finished their book sharing projects and they were sharing them with each other. So my class was sharing with, with Jeannie's. And the way we did that is we broke them up into small groups. And they loved it because they felt that they really got to know the other people in that group who they were um, viewing. So I put that out there because sometimes when you have three, you know, when you're doing three at once and you're sharing this personal stuff, this might be a little hard to get as much feedback as you would like than if you kind of broke them up. So I'm just kind of putting it out there. But this was, we got, um, and it wasn't like, re you know, it was like 30 minutes I think we gave so. to, um, you know, everybody to share. So it was like six in everybody's group. And that, that worked out, you know, between two classes. Mm -hmm. It worked out well. There, there is one thing that we, I think we, we, we didn't mention. Uh, the first uh, video conference we're going to have is the kind of, that they will be uh, asked uh, a week before to, uh, to bring to the class something, something. This something could be anything, uh, or everything, actually. Could be uh, a glass or a cup, mm -hmm. or could be a, a, a family member, or could be a poem, mm -hmm. or a dance, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Something with, uh, which uh, will actually give um, the most important information about themselves. Yeah, that's always good. Yeah, they they gonna uh, they gonna uh, mm -hmm. show it in the class and explain why did they choose these things and why it's actually represent who they are and their values and what is important to them. It's so exactly. once once we do it, once we do it in a video conference and everybody can see everybody present whatever is important to them, we believe it will you know, break the ice, so to say, and, and, and make it uh, later uh, easier for them, you know, to approach each other. I think that's a great idea. Um, what, what might be helpful is to have them write it and upload it first. Or, film, a, or, or, or video it and upload it as a video. Yeah. First, because then they'll be, they'll get reinforced. Oh, I remember, and that's the person that you know, I attach to, which is sort of a thought. That's a good idea. I will add to that and also to the video conferencing of three hours. Well, Some, if someone going to represent, if we, he, will be made, he or she will, will be shocked that to, to, to stand in front of how many? 60 people? And speaking English, about it, maybe to make a kind of a rehearsal, mm -hmm. yeah. record it in advance, mm -hmm. put it online, and then as we prepare our uh, slideshows, we go before the conferences. Yeah. And now we do it out of spread, just in the beginning of the real time. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, the clock is yeah. Yeah. and I will tell you that when they started, we thought an hour was going to be too long. And what happened? You're right? You could have used more. And, and, and you know, and that will help if they upload it or they get organized, it will 
help everyone limit their time and focus on what they want to say because we all know it's easy to go off on a little tangent or yeah. something. And, that, and yeah. also an yeah. online conversation, how many the whole group will be? Counting the uh, forty-five, maybe. I don't know. Managing a video conference for forty-five people—it's a chaotic task. Uh, how to do it in real time? The first of all, you have to decide who is the moderator in every moment. Because three moderators is awful. <laughs> one, and then conversation, and if. 20 we want to respond, what you do then? So you maybe you have to prepare in advance also two, three, four respondents, like someone that we do in a conference, we prepare a session. And we, we have kind of a show, a prepared show, someone will do the presentation, and we have three respondents that prepare themselves, and then if we have time left, other join in. And also, you may offer an option to respond after that online by text. Yeah. So that, that may, may, maybe our own students will not be confident enough to respond in real time, mm -hmm. but they maybe want to respond after that. And also, if it would be possible to record the video conference. They can, they can they look at it again and then respond in their free time. It would be helpful, maybe, for a few of them. I never had such an experience. You can certainly do that, yeah. yeah. The other thing you can do is, can't, you, can't we run a, a, another screen that would allow us to have a Twitter uh, account where they can respond? And if they don't feel comfortable speaking, they can type no, it no, as Twitter. Like what I said, not responding in real time. No, I know that's a good idea, but I'm saying for the people, in addition to that, the people that would want to respond. You can do a discussion. Because we're talking about three hours. And you can record the video. If we had a screen where they could do the Twitter, that would be, you know, that would be very good. Well, it gets too complicated. Yeah, we take... Did you do it with Smodar? Yeah, we were Smodar and uh, Old Allen, uh -huh. and we typed everything. Oh, yeah. We oh, typed okay. and it was okay. It was okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've seen it done. It's very effective.